You all want to get the most from your records, but how do you do that when you don't even know what it means? Well, we trust in R&D to advance the state of the art. The turntable industry, however, well, it's unlike any other, cars, cameras, or TVs. Take TVs. Compare a 1960s CRT to present day OLED. The OLED's picture and resolution makes it a no contest and they're affordable. Now, shouldn't that be the same for turntables? Well, there's a video by a dealer comparing an SL1500C, it weighs 15 kilograms, to a 1200G, that weighs 25 kilograms. In it, he felt, oh, highly scientific, that the 1200G's heavier top plate would be superior. He didn't provide any measurements or do any demonstrations. Similarly, reviews regale in heavier decks or new power supplies and so on, describing each new, and of course more costly, implementation as a vastly improved feast for the ears. Are they correct? Because, you see, there's another video, and this one's a gem. It actually compares two decks, one from the 1960s, and the other, it's modern, and it weighs some wait for it, 770 pounds, that's 350 kilos. Let's set the scene. Imagine Top Gear pitting a 1960s Mini, that's around five grand, against a Lamborghini Aventador. That's some 500,000. Yes, the Mini might charge around rooftops in the Italian job, but in reality, it is no contest. Now we get to our video. The decks were a 1960s ARX, on eBay you pick those up for about 80 bucks, and a Tech Das Zero, that's 500,000 plus. Now the Aventador's presence makes sense. Alternatively, you could sell your house, just please yourself. With Tech Das costing 100 times and weighing 12 times more than the 1200G, against the AR, it's got to be another no contest. Mm, I wouldn't rush to start pawning your diamonds quite yet. You see, what sets this video apart is that the results aren't from people with a vested interest. No dealers, no reviewers. Just audio files who can download unmarked files of each deck to listen to on their own systems using their own ears. Now that's novel. Only once they'd chosen were the identities of the decks revealed. The test was blind and you can't get fairer. And the results? Well, on a roughly 60-40 split, the listeners preferred, yep, the 60-year-old AR, costing some 6,250 times less. The link to the video is at the bottom. Unlike the TV's comparison, Whichever way you spin the results, replay performance has largely stagnated. And the question is why? For decades, Hi-Fi Smoke and Mirrors has encouraged you all to spend more. We're actually living the story of the Emperor's new clothes. Companies have grown, but not replay performance. Isn't this something you should be unhappy about? Isolation Bubble is different. It delivers state-of-the-art reproduction and for a limited outlay. It works like Formula One. It's physics and applied science-based, so there's no confusion. I'm Arthur Kubisarian. I own both Pink Triangle and The Funk Firm. As a physicist, I hold more patents for sound quality in record replay than anyone else in history, all for one goal, and that's to recreate that original tape sound. Because tape is the best sound we have. This is what I mean. My math master was a superb recording engineer, and he even owned his own record label. His listening room was at the top of a townhouse. One day, 
he played me a recording of a train coming out of a tunnel. I was so taken aback by the sound, all I could think was, what's a train doing this high up in the air? When sound is that good, you get hooked. And what a fly. His records came from his own superb tapes. Yet with a wave of his hand, John would just merely dismiss record replay with, oh, they're just groove grinders. How could he say that? Records were, well, they were the only way, the only source we had to listen. But I was able to compare the records to his tapes. And I could see why he said they were poor. Comparing the record to tape. There it was in front of me. Tape. We have our reference. This was the 70s. Thorin's TD-125s, SME arms, and of course Lynn's LP-12, about which the magazines were positively on fire. John had no time for any of it. He used a Connoisseur BD-1 and a Decker. To my eyes, and being charitable, his setup could at best be described as um, utilitarian. But he assured me it bested all. Yeah, right. He was in his 50s, and to a 14-year-old, he was ancient. What would he know of the latest and greatest? I had a transcript as hydraulic reference, with its vanishingly low, rumble-wound flutter and no mat. But I tried John's tape test. It failed. It didn't much matter, because I was already sold, and busily dreaming of a real turntable with a platter and a felt mat. I had to have an LP-12. It would give me the sound I craved. As for the tape test, that's surely going to be a mere formality. Ignoring John, I saved up and bought one, only to be immediately underwhelmed. But given all the reviews back to LP-12, I could only think it was my ears that had to be faulty. But I still applied the acid test. Do you really need to ask? My precious new costly LP12, it failed. Crestfallen, yes, but at the same time, I was relieved it wasn't my ears. Well, come on, I was still just 15. As for John's modest deck, it came top of the three. John really knew what he was talking about. The hubris of youth, eh? But review confusion remained. I craved tapes sound. On magazine's so-called expert advice, I would bought the absolute very best, only to prove that records sounded poor. The challenge remained, how to approach the sound of tape. And now you know about it, it should also be your goal as well. The physicist in me had stirred. Was quality being lost during the pressing transfer process, in which case we were screwed? Or was it our limited understanding of replay technology that was failing us? Well, the answer had to wait for a physics degree as I started to understand the mechanisms. All the while, the industry was generating a lot of smoke and that continues to this day. But in my 40 years, I've yet to come across a single person using the tape test. Today's reality is that reviews are more about marketing than providing useful information. It's profit over performance. And that explains how we ended up with the utterly ridiculous result at the start of this talk. Subjectivity. It leaves people free to say anything they want without consequence like plinth vibrations. In fact, the question of music mixing with plinth vibrations, well, it presents an interesting conundrum. If we can't separate them, perhaps plinth vibrations really are damaging music. If only. Well, the thing is, I've done it. And no, I'm not beating my chest. Here's your first exercise. Can you think of how I separated music and plinth vibration. 
Pause the video if you wish. And here's a clue. We can all do it. I just do it precisely. Okay, if you're back, then simply play the unmodulated track of a test disc. With no music, what's left? Just a bit of rumble and the wretched plinth vibrations. Actually, you don't even need a test disc. You can use a disc with a long run out groove. It's a simple real world test. And what do we find? Not a lot. With nothing to affect your music, Myth 1 is busted. So for actual improvement, we need to look elsewhere. And that's the subject of the next video. It applies to over 99% of you. Ignore it and your performance won't approach tape, limiting your potential musical enjoyment. If you've enjoyed this video, then please click the like button and subscribe and see you in the next video. I leave you with a reminder of where my personal isolation bubble journey began.